Hello. We're going to talk about stereochemistry again. In the last video, you talked about using NOE or NOSE to determine geometric isomers um, and diastereomers, sometimes even just conformations if they're frozen into one conformation. It shows you who is near each other in space. However, enantiomers, who are mirror images, have identical melting points, solubility, IR, proton NMR, carbon NMR, so they're very difficult to tell apart. So we're going to talk about two common techniques in this PowerPoint, shift reagents and derivatization that can be used to learn more about the stereoisomer that you have. So chiral reagents, chiral shift reagents, are lanthanide metals that already have a chiral group on it. And you know from previous courses that a chiral molecule will interact with another chiral molecule in, one, in a specific way, that hand and glove type of thing. So lanthanide shift reagents will bind to a, an oxygen or a nitrogen. And um, due to the chiral reagent or chiral ligands on it, will interact with it in a different, some of the side chains in a different way. And what happens is, is that you see a spreading out of the shifts. These, this is the regular compound and then this is bound to the lanthanide. And you can see that the peaks spread out and you see much more clear peaks. If you look at an example, racemic 1-phenylethylamine, if I put this in with a chiral shift reagent and then I look at this peak here at four, this is my hydrogen next to the nitrogen, and this is binding to the lanthanide shift reagent, this hydrogen is uh, spread apart into two different quartets, one from the R isomer and one from the S isomer. And conveniently, you can now integrate into what your enantiomeric excess is or how much of the R to the S you have. And you can um, determine whether or not you have a racemic mixture or some sort of an antimeric mixture. If you throw the lanthanide shift reagent in and nothing changes, then maybe you have a pure molecule. However, lanthanide shift reagents are sort of expensive. They um, only work if there's a Lewis base to bind to them, and they only work in to spread apart peaks where it's not a very clut cluttered spectrum. So for example, there's nobody, no other peaks near this peak at four. So when they spread out, it doesn't overlap with other peaks. So more common way is to take your uh, compound, especially if you think it's pure compound and you wanna know whether it's RS, you can take this compound and react it with the two possible of a chiral uh, acid chloride. This is a Mosher ester. There are a variety of these. They're not all Mosher esters. That was the name of the first one, but it's a esterification or amidification process. So when I make these two possible products, let me get the right number of carbons in here. I've got this is the R, and it will stay the R in both products. But if I react it with an R and an S, I'm going to get diastereomers. So I don't want to spend too much time drawing these, but um, I'm going to have a phenyl. And in this case, the oxygen is back and the CF3 is forward. So I have diastereomers now. And diastereomers have different properties and different NMRs. Um, they have different chemical shifts. So this is a good way to look at the chemical shifts and use that to determine your stereochemistry. So we're going to walk through that. Um, and part of how what happens is that this hydrogen will line up with the carbonyl. So we need a secondary alcohol usually. So this works best with secondary 
um, OH groups or amine groups or alcohols or amines on a secondary carbon. So we have a small group that will line up with the carbonyl and then the CF3 will line up in the backbone. And um, that's about the LUMU. So then what happens is the R1 group will line up with the phenyl if this is the S derivative and the R2 will line up with the OCH3. So the R1 group will be shifted up field because that phenyl group will shield it and the R2 group will move down field because it's next to the oxygen. So an example here is, let's see, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six. This is um, supposed to be pentanol. I think I have too many carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six. I have hexanol there. So, um, but we're gonna look at pentanol in the next screen. So this is my butyl group here. And that's lined up with the oxygen. So we would expect the butyl group to shift um, downfield because it's next to the oxygen, whereas the phenyl is in the same plane as the methyl group on this secondary alcohol. And so it will move upfield. And we can take a look. Here's our regular, here's our mixture before we made the ester. And that um, methyl, which is a doublet. So this is the CH3 next to the CHOH next to the chiral center. This moved upfield. So this one must be next to the phenyl. This must be the R derivative because the methyl moved downfield. So if I did it with the R, this is going to move downfield. So this one is the R derivative, and this is the S derivative of the ester. So I haven't changed the pentanol. I just reacted it with two possible different chiral esters. So what we tend to do is take our, uh, our chiral center and react it with both the R and the S derivative. So here's the S, here's the R. And the R1 group in the S will move one direction and it'll move the opposite direction downfield when it's in the R. And by definition, we just take the delta, the shift, the delta delta, um, and we subtract the shift of the S minus the R and we exa exaggerate the shift differences. And if that delta is larger than zero, then this will be the R2 group. If the delta is less than zero, that must be the R1. And that sounds a little arbitrary, but let's take a look at an example. So here's my pentanol. Here's the delta delta data. No, that sounds weird. So this is the negative. And over here on this side, it's really a propyl on the last slide, it was butyl. This is a delta delta that's negative, and this is the delta delta that's positive. So remember, if the delta is greater than zero, it must be the R2. So if we redraw this, and I'm just gonna put the O here, and the H down, and then this is my R1, and the R1 is less than zero. So the R1 must be my propyl group. And the methyl group is negative and, whoops, I did it wrong. R1 is negative. Okay. Ah, let's cross that out. I did it wrong. Um, so here we go. Do it again. R1, R2, put the, meth uh, the hydrogen down, the oxygen there. This is R1. R1 must be negative. R1 is the methyl. And the positive deltas have to be the R2. So we'll put those on here. That's my propyl group. And we're looking at what was the chirality of the oxygen before I made the ester. So here I just drew it as the alcohol. So now I have my structure here and I can, I wanna look at it with the hydrogen pointing away. 
So this would be S. So it would be one, two, three, and I'm going this direction when I'm looking down at it. So given this delta delta data, you should be able to figure out the R and S. And there are several problems in Canvas and some links to other places where you can practice this.